Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guests. In this case, it's Kiss Chris Fabricant. And now, fortunately, there is a paperback of his sensational book that came out in hardcover. I'll hold it up because we also make a video of this called Junk Science and the American Criminal Justice System. And I, I just, I, I found it compelling uh, to read. I, uh, you know, I read it when it first came out and talked about it and heard a lot about it. But until you get to do these podcasts, it forces you to actually <laughs> spend a couple of days with a book, which is not a bad thing to do. And so why don't we just cut right through it? Uh, the great uh, hope of, of uh, justice has been DNA. And uh, it, it is, and it's an imperfect mechanism because DNA can be messed with and so forth. Uh, you know, labs, Police labs are notorious for messing around. But nonetheless, it allowed great lawyers like Chris Fabrigan to be able to say, no, it's not just speculation. In the case of this uh, young naval uh, you know, this sailor on a boat in, where was it, Newport, uh, you know, uh, and this guy would have been put away forever, and it was put away for a long time, and because all of these professional law people and everybody else in the system said, come on, I could smell it, he's guilty, and so forth. He didn't have the mustache that the witness had done. That was the one that got me reading your book. How do you get around the mustache of somebody who was supposed to attack a woman and, you know, done terrible things? She, he either did or didn't, and he didn't, but I'll let you go into that. But it was a compelling case of somebody whose life would have been destroyed and was not the person who did it. And then they found the person who did it. And the book goes on to a number of other cases that you pursued. So you're actually this tough, brilliant lawyer who's willing to go for the underdog. And I find most people, when I talk to them, they actually think most people in jail are guilty. Uh, and most people I talk to haven't spent any time in prison and don't understand how coercive and vicious it is. I've only spent a few days here and there in different countries, but it was enough to give me a taste of it. So I'm going to let you take it over in this book. And I should mention that you uh, help run or run the Innocence Project or a top lawyer there. And it, it's probably the one outfit around that everybody respects. I haven't heard anybody put it down. You guys do your homework, you guys and women do your homework, and uh, you get great results. But still, uh, there are a lot of innocent people in jail despite the Innocence Project. So uh, take it from there and tell us about the book. Well, you know, I, one of the things that you say as far as how many innocent people are in prison, you know, I mean, and, and I think, you know, people are always surprised when I say this and that that most people that are tried and convicted of serious crimes are guilty. Right. And the um, and, you know, at least some of the acts that were charged, they're often, you know, sentenced to outrageous, you know, time. And, and there are lots of other injustices. But if you think that right now we have around two point three million people incarcerated in this country. And if you think that maybe one percent of these people are innocent, you're talking about tens of thousands of people. And the Innocence Project is a relatively small organization. So certainly we're not getting to everybody. And the Supreme Court makes it more and more difficult to challenge convictions and post-conviction every day. Every decision that's come out over the last 10 years has made it more difficult. So the problem that and that the Innocence Project has exposed, you know, over the 30 years that we've been in business, you know, they would go back to the 90s. <laughs> and it's important to think about what we understood about the criminal justice system at that time. And that was virtually everybody believed that, you know, with notable exceptions, that jury trials in the American criminal justice system was the best in the world, and that wrongful convictions, to the extent that they ever occurred, were vanishingly rare uh, occurrences. And what we believed in were things like eyewitness identification and confessions, and certainly forensic sciences that it helped assure that these convictions had integrity. And so, when forensic DNA evidence became available to use in the criminal legal system, we were able to, for the first time, actually be able to know ground truth. We would know if somebody was there or not there in a way that you could never have been certain of in the past. 
And one of the things that was really important, what was genius about the way that Barry, P Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, when they first established uh, the Innocence Project, when they were thinking about how they were going to decide what kind of cases that they took, what the in intake criteria was. And what they decided was that they were not going to make any subjective judgments about guilt or innocence. Right? They weren't going to take a look at a case and say, well, you know, there were 10 eyewitnesses or that this person confessed or that there was forensic evidence that was pointing to guilt. The only criteria is going to be if we can find and test biological evidence in this case for DNA. And if that came out in a way that was favorable to the client, would that exonerate them? That was the only criteria. So as a result of this, they took cases and overturned convictions where there were six, seven, eight eyewitnesses who had all identified the defendant. There were detailed confessions that apologized to victims that, that included details that allegedly only the perpetrator could have known. And of course, there were forensic sciences. And what we learned by overturning all of these convictions through the power, the truth-telling power of DNA, is that eyewitness identification is grossly unreliable. It's a leading contributing factor to wrongful convictions. And forensic sciences, which are supposed to be the gold standard of proof in criminal courts, right? Only sex sells better than science, right? You know what I mean? That we rely on science. This is why advertisers use science, right? Scientifically tested and proven. 50%, more than 50% of convictions that were overturned through DNA evidence is attributable at least in part to the use of junk science. And all the techniques that I write about in my book are still admissible today, even though we know that these techniques have led to gross miscarriages of justice. And I write about four wrongful executions, all based, at least in part, on the use of unreliable forensic evidence in my book. So this was, you know, the earthquake that really has been rippling through the criminal legal system really since the advent of forensic DNA and it's being harnessed by the Innocence Project. And you're right. Overwhelmingly, people have a positive um, idea and, and, and of, of the Innocence Project. But one of the things that's really been surprising to me is that is how many adversaries that we actually have, not in the general public, but within the criminal legal system, is that we have prosecutors that will deny the innocence of our clients, right? And that we have judges that will refuse to hear new evidence of innocence. And we have the Supreme Court that denies the opportunity for our clients to present evidence of compelling evidence of innocence in federal court. So while, yes, it's true in the general public that, you know, there, there are a groundswell of support for freeing the innocent, in the criminal justice system, by the people who are making the decisions, that's not the case. But it's, it's difficult if you have a, a DNA test. You, you make the point, actually, early on in your book, the, the DNA test can establish the innocence uh, but it's not necessarily going to be helpful to, um, the other way. I mean, you if, if it comes out right and you they, they have that test, uh, but uh, may, well, let's go into that. I mean, and, and um, but it had a clarity that other science doesn't have, like bites. Your book has a lot about bites, right? And, and, and dentists claiming they're forensic uh, detectives. And in fact, for much of that activity, they weren't even really board certified or expert or really didn't know. That's all invented that. stuff anyway, yeah, right? Yeah. Board certification. So we should examine. Okay. So the appeal of DNA is real science once it, they got their act together. And, and yes, it tells you a lot. It doesn't tell you everything. It doesn't tell you whether the DNA was tampered with. And, and if the DNA has... Uh, disappeared because too much time has passed and you can't use it. Uh, but the, your book really stresses all the other areas of expertise that are impressive to juries and judges and lawyers. And let's examine this title, Junk Science, uh, because you really expose it as that, Junk Science. And so why don't you go into that? Because you have people appearing in a courtroom and they have advanced degrees and they talk a good game and so forth. And then in your book, you, you uh, do an autopsy on this and, and show this is nonsense. That in yeah. fact, unless you, what, what is the way you put it? Unless you break deep with a bite, 
you really can't. I, I, I forget the, the, the physiology the of it, uh, but, but it doesn't really tell you a damn thing. No, I mean, well, the, what's important to kind of keep in mind is one is that you know junk science is a pejorative term, and the and forensic experts certainly don't like it. So I tried to be very careful about the way I defined junk science in the book, and I I defined it as subjective speculation masquerading as scientific evidence. And to break that down a little, right, is that real science is based on basic foundational research and research that's done in the field, right? And it's done, it's peer reviewed, it's subject to scrutiny by the, the outside mainstream scientists that are disinterested in the results, and that's published, and it's challenged, and, and, the, and then it's not released to the public as valid science until it's been through the scientific method. Junk science is fundamentally a, an expert's opinion, typically based on training and experience on the received wisdom from the field. And in junk science, there are two things that are really important to kind of understand is that there are no measurements taken. And if they are taken, they're meaningless. And then all of your listeners that have a science background will understand this. And this is true with hard science, so-called hard sciences or social sciences, is that you're always measuring something, right? And that's why I give you an idea of, you know, whatever it is that you're testing is that there's a measurement taken, right? And that's why we have randomized controlled studies, right? So you have a, a control group, and then you're going to measure the effect of whatever variable you're trying to introduce. So in junk science, what you have is somebody that is eyeballing the evidence and coming to an opinion. And what in all other sciences, outside of forensics, the influence of bias, cognitive bias, is well known and understood, and there are efforts to mitigate this bias. So I'll give you an example. If you think about you know, the, how problematic a, a biased opinion can be, think about latent fingerprint evidence, right? This is kind of the gold standard of traditional forensic techniques. Fingerprint evidence was thought to be essentially infallible until we had the Brandon Mayfield case. And this is a mild-mannered uh, lawyer in Oregon who, um, whose fingerprints were identified as, coming, as being on the blast caps that were used to blow up the commuter train in Spain in 2004, in which 270-something people died and many thousands were injured. And the only evidence they had against him was fingerprints. He was arrested. He was held incommunicado by the FBI and the and Brandon Mayfield was saying, hey, these are my fingerprints. I've never been out of the country, literally never been out of the country. I don't even have a passport. But what they found was that Brandon Mayfield was married to an Egyptian national. He had converted to uh, Islam. He had once represented a man that had been convicted of providing material aid to a terrorist organization. So this is the profile that the FBI had in mind as who was you know, responsible for this type of crime. And so the court brought in an independent expert. The court assigned, very unusual, an independent expert to examine the evidence. The independent expert concluded that it was Brandon Mayfield's print. Brandon Mayfield hired an expert. His own expert concluded that it was his own print. And it wasn't until the Spanish authorities identified a better candidate for this crime and whose fingerprints were also matched is that they finally admitted this mistake. So this was a, a, a shock that just resonated throughout the forensic community because of, you know, we thought that fingerprints were, you know, infallible. And so a very clever um, experiment was done by uh, Dr. ETL Drawer a well-known cognitive neuroscientist at University of London. And what he did is that he gathered a group of highly qualified forensic experts and he asked them to do an analysis of these cases, uh, these fingerprint cases. And what was clever is that he didn't tell any of these experts that this was, in fact, their own prior casework that they were being asked to review. And so they didn't know that it already come to conclusions on this evidence. And the only thing that he changed was the irrelevant contextual information that was included in the case files and things like the suspect confessed or that there are lots of eyewitnesses or something. And three fifths of these experts changed their original opinion based on nothing to do with the actual fingerprints, but just that conformed to the prosecution theory that was included in the case file. 
And that still goes on today. And that's true with fingerprints. It's true with bite marks. It's true with ballistics evidence. It's true with blood spatter. It's true with shaken baby syndrome. It's true with arson investigations. It's true with hair microscopy. All these are subjective techniques that rely on human judgment that are no effort to shield what the prosecution's theory is and the theory of guilt. And so when you have no research that's underlying the opinions, when you have this received wisdom that's passed down from generation to generation, when you have egos and careers and livelihoods that are built up on the continued acceptance of this technique, and you have no shields of cognitive bias, you have a recipe for gross miscarriages of justice. And that's why I called it junk science. And I want to make one more point about junk science, which I tried to make in the book, is that this, the reason that we know about this, the, this term junk science. The reason that it's a part of popular culture before my book came out was had nothing to do with the criminal justice system at all. It was the civil justice system that this became an issue. And it was in the 90s where corporations in the like 70s and 80s and into the 90s, corporations were getting sued, the Dow Con Shield litigation, all the breast implant litigation, the Ford Pinto litigation, all of these cases, right? All these mass torts, class action cases was developing a whole cottage industry of expert witnesses that didn't exist prior to the World War II, you know, that this all sprung up and fueled this massive growth in the civil justice system. And plaintiff's attorneys were getting rich, suing a lot of these corporations and using a lot of junk science, a lot of bogus expert witnesses. Now, I'm not like, you know, a corporate defender or anything like that, but they were had a point. There was a lot of junk science being used. And these, like some of these experts were no longer even working in the field. The only thing they were only right. their professional witnesses, right? So they just to be put it in historical perspective, these corporations had invented junk science. If you think of the famous case of whether cigarettes are lethal right. or anything, I mean the tobacco companies owned scientists. They set up the exams. They justified it. This was certainly true of the chemical industry. Absolutely. And, yeah. So, but, but what they, know, they, they but, when it started to get balanced and then even go further, maybe in the other direction, people raised questions about it. And, uh, and what they said, and this was a guy, there was a, a book that was written by a fellow from the Manhattan Institute called Galileo's Revenge, Junk Science in Our Courts. And that was the person, that was the book that that coined the term junk science. And that book was cited in the Supreme Court case that changed the standard for the admissibility of so-called scientific evidence that made courts judge the, the rigor under which that these expert opinions were being proffered. And it radically changed the way that civil litigation and toxic tort and product liability done because they were basically labeling these junk science and they were able to get these opinions excluded. But that debate, even though we know that the the courts are now they're hip to the idea that you know that not all these expert opinions are valid and 40% increase in the exclusion of expert witnesses after the supreme court decision known as Daubert the criminal justice system even after the IP the innocence project exposed how much junk science was being used nothing changed in the criminal justice system at all and that there was no uptick in excluding what we know had been leading to wrongful convictions. And this is why I explore this theme, poor people science in my book, right? Is that because that's what we get in the criminal justice system. We get poor people science because we don't care about the life and liberty of the poor and disproportionately black and brown people that are prosecuted in our criminal justice system. So I'm trying to bring the junk science debate into criminal courts. I understand. But let me ask you a question because we still have this myth that everybody gets their day in court, and if it's a serious crime, they get legal what we say. And we have good people like you who work as at times at public defenders and, and so forth and give it their, their best shot. But in almost every case that I've examined or written about or read about, usually it's not true at the beginning. <laughs> at the beginning, usually somebody is supposed to be plea bargained or they're assumed to be guilty or no one really thinks about other ways of approaching it, right? Uh, we, we don't get that uh, OJ defense uh, and so forth. So that that's a myth. But I also want to ask, 
uh, this whole question of can you re-examine things? Is it settled already? And you said, because I have to be true confession, uh, I, I actually like uh, some of Robert's stuff on the Supreme Court, particularly around privacy and, and other things. And you mentioned, though, that this court is not for letting cases be reopened and is not for second chances. So correct no. me here. No, I mean, what we understand about you know the criminal justice system is that overwhelmingly crimes, particularly violent crimes, are prosecuted in state court. Overwhelmingly, these are elected uh, officials, district attorneys, judges, including appellate judges, and that is where um, wrongful convictions happen, <laughs> overwhelmingly. And what the the way that our legal system is set up is that when you have a criminal conviction in state court, once it goes through the appellate process, you are entitled to have the your conviction reviewed in federal court for constitutional violations, something like your right to counsel was violated or <coughs> or that you didn't get uh, the right to confront witnesses against you or juror misconduct or you know things that that made uh, due process violations. And what happened was when Bill Clinton signed the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act in 1997, what it did was begin to saw off avenues of post-conviction relief in federal court. And federal court was really important because all the political pressures that are associated with the justice system at the state court level are, at least in theory, mitigated in federal court because the judges have lifetime tenure, they didn't preside over the case themselves, and that you could bring new evidence of innocence into federal court and get your conviction thrown out if appropriate. And what this statute did and the subsequent interpretation of that statute by the Supreme Court has made it nearly impossible to get federal courts to review state court convictions. And that has in turn made it nearly impossible to overturn a wrongful conviction if you don't have really, really compelling DNA evidence, and even then it's impossible, or prosecutors that are agreeing um, that the conviction is not reliable and, and joining motions to overturn those convictions. So, you know, for example, I mean, this, this is just, you know, this year in um, the Supreme Court decided a case called Shin. And what they decided, and this was a very compelling actual innocence case, that there was new evidence of innocence that they wanted to present at a hearing in federal court. And the Supreme Court interpreted, even despite the grave threat to um, this person's life and liberty, that the statute that is interpreted by the Supreme Court precluded the presenting of new evidence of innocence in federal court. So, you know, the, the hostility towards, you know, the disruptive nature of a wrongful conviction and the threat to the integrity of the criminal justice system is protected by these types of decisions. Okay, but we can blame this, I guess, on the Roberts Court. But didn't the tightening up of standards go back to a, more of a bipartisan approach? And, yeah, I said it was Bill Clinton. Right. Yeah. He, he, he signed this terrible bill. Right. You know, I mean, um, there there it, it's only been, you know, and I've been doing this type of work for 25 years now. And if you told me 25 years ago that a um, you know, that marijuana would be legal in New York City. Right. With the, the marijuana arrest capital of the world, literally for decades and that the drug war would be something that people had come to realize was a total failure and racist, you know, I wouldn't have believed you, you know what I mean? And so it was always politically expedient to get tough on crime for both sides. You know, I mean, they're competing, you know, the, the Democrats and the Republicans or who could be tougher on crime. And it wasn't until we woke up, you know, maybe 10 years ago and looked around and saw that we were leading the world in mass incarceration and wrongful convictions were not just, you know, vanishingly rare, but um, horrifyingly common that criminal justice reform became an issue that you could actually run on. And that would be something that, you know, is that the general public would be interested in, in, electing so-called progressive DAs to the extent that such a thing exists. So, you know, that's my small hope of optimism around this is that, yes, 
it has been both sides to the extent that it's a sides thing that have ratcheted up our carceral state to the the human yeah, rights violations the, that it is now. This number, 2.3 million that you use, I mean, even if one assumes, as you did earlier, that most of these people committed some kind of crime, uh, you know, the, the penalties are not exactly the same for the rich and the poor, the highly represented, the poorly represented, and so forth. And also what happens, you know, like I teach at a university where out, the outside community in downtown, you know, central L.A. near USC, there are arrests almost every day. Uh, you know, what, well, who are these people? What kind of education they did? What kind of, you know, and so forth. And, and w- one of the things that I, I do want to get to before we wrap this up is, yes, DNA has been a great way of uh, putting accountability uh, because, okay, you got it. And as you say in your book, and we didn't go through all your cases, but they're compelling. By the way, the book, Junk Science and the American Criminal Justice System, but is a joy to read. I hate to say, use that word because it's about depressing things of people being uh, wrongfully convicted. But I mean, in terms of telling a story about human beings, uh, I do want to pay a compliment to you. And Thank I know you. you have very famous people, you know, like John Grisham and others, and and you got great reviews and so forth. So it's very accessible. And, and it's a human story. And I still can't get over it. I, I don't know what it means to be a sailor in the Navy and someone accuses you of having done this heinous crime and, and, and people believe it and your family comes and visits you and they expect you to be there forever. And, you know, fortunately, there is this device of a DNA test that then you can turn it around. I have two questions about that because very often there isn't a good DNA sample. If there is, there's a real concern about whether it's been manipulated, you know, uh, and the people doing the testing, uh, I, I bring up, for instance, the Kevin Cooper case here in California, true confession. My wife started out writing about it. She's now part of, you know, believes in, in that he should, he is innocent. And then from what I've looked at the evidence, I certainly think that. And certainly he didn't get his day in court. But it's interesting. It's the opposite of the stories you tell in your book. In this case, the only witness to this heinous crime, uh, you know, uh, is a was a young kid who said it was three white guys who did it. Kevin Cooper's a single black man who ends up being accused of the crime. And the thing, and so there's no evidence connecting him with being at the crime scene. There's no eyewitness, nothing. The only thing is a late claim of DNA found on a wall, one little spot, and on a T-shirt. So here's an example, If and, and I happen to think it's accurate, but one could argue about that. But what is true is the DNA evidence uh, is used to trump everything else. There's no other corroboration of any kind. There was no early witness identification or anything. And then the argument is, well, who are the people collecting the DNA? And it turns out, well, they got a spotty record. Oh, that person robbed guns from the county when they were, you know, in the sheriff's office or that they played with evidence. We got a lot of scandals, uh, even in the supposedly more enlightened state of California, of law enforcement people playing loose with the evidence and the information. Why was there a bottle of uh, Kevin Cooper's uh, little dog of his DNA next to where they were doing the testing and so forth. So I just wanted to ask you about that. DNA, yes, it's been great, but it also can be misused. Uh, yeah. Powerful technology like that is, you know, it has to be, you know, it's only as valuable as it's been collected and tested and the chain of custody is very clear and that there's no opportunity for contamination either, you know, accidentally or deliberately, you know, so yeah, you know, I mean, that's, um, you know, what else to say about it? You know, I mean, I, if, if it can be manipulated like anything else, you know, I mean, and if there isn't a clear chain of custody and there's opportunities, particularly if there are known bad actors, I don't know about this case, um, other than a little bit of, uh, familiarity with all potential miscarriages of justice, 
that, you know, if there's opportunity and bad actors have that opportunity and there's compelling evidence of innocence, then the very least, it sounds to me like there should be a new trial and one that's done with fairly tested evidence and that you can remove these kind of, you know, doubts, you know, I mean, and I think that, that, you know, so often in our cases, because we don't have such, you know, slam dunk DNA, whether it's been, you know, well preserved or not, is that there's certainly plenty to show that the trial was not fair. And often I get frustrated because what we're asking for is a new trial, one in which junk science wasn't used. And if there's a conviction after that, then there's a conviction, you know, I mean, and we'll have to live with that, regardless of what we think the ground truth of the matter was. And so it sounds to me like this, there's enough here and to require a new trial. And it goes back to exactly what we've been talking about before, too, is getting a new trial. The procedural barriers that are put up in front of that are overwhelming, right? Overwhelming. So, and I imagine in that case, they were running up against those as well, even though I, I know nothing about the, you yeah, know. I, and I don't want to, I mean, and I would like before we end, if you could go through uh, the other cases in your book and your own experience and, you know, to remind people, we're talking about lives. I mean, we're talking about people uh, sitting there for 20, 30 years in prison and maybe by accident, you guy like you comes along and is willing to defend them. I mean, uh, and- the arbitrariness is scary, you know, yeah. I mean, it is that, you know, and how lucky you have to be to get an innocence project lawyer is, you know, you're one in a million, you know, one of the scenes that I usually read in, in my readings that I've done around the country is, is when I met my first innocence project client, Stephen Cheney, who was convicted of murdering two drug dealers in, in Dallas, Texas, you know, based on bite mark evidence, shoe print evidence, polygraph and presumptive blood tests, all junk science, all of which was wrong. And I started writing the book actually in the, the paperback update talks about, you know, when I started writing the book was in the parking lot of that prison after having met him because it was such an emotional experience for me because I realized that he'd been waiting for somebody like me to come along for 25 years and the ordeal that he'd already been through. And the amount of power he thought that I had to wave a magic wand and make a prison door open. And so what I did is that you've been talking a little bit about the Keith Harward case. And Mr. Harward was a Navy sailor who has uh, spent 33 years in prison for a rape and a murder he did not commit. That was based on junk science. And Stephen Cheney, the case I just mentioned. just connected to what we were saying before. He's the guy who was a... Yeah, so he was a sailor. Clean shaven. he was what, about 20 something? Yeah. So what, what happened in that case is it's a fascinating case. And I opened the book with it because it's so compelling is that there was a young couple, a young married couple that were asleep in their um, house in Newport News, Virginia in 1982. And somebody in a sailor's uniform broke into the back door. They had three kids that were asleep down the hall, went up into the married couple's uh, bedroom where they were asleep. He uh, bludgeoned to death the husband with a crowbar, and then he sexually tortured the wife for about three hours while the cho- and, and told her not to cry out or he would attack her children. So she quietly endured this for three hours. He bit her up and down her legs and the thighs, um, stole money from her purse and left. And he w- the only description, because she'd been blindfolded through much of the ordeal that the woman, the victim could provide was that he was a sailor about five foot 10, um, about 150 pounds, clean shaven, and the insignia on his uniform suggested a low ranking sailor. So there were about 3000 sailors uh, stationed in Newport at that time, and um, more than 3000, it was 3000 that generally fit that general description yeah. and, and they didn't had mentioned his race, but uh, he was white. Old. Yes. yes. Right. The, um, and so they really had nothing to go on. They um, had no witnesses, no particular motive. They had no forensic evidence was discovered at the scene, no fingerprints, no nothing, right? And so what they had were these bite marks. And this had been just after the Stephen, uh, the Ted Bundy case, which I devote some time to because it's what drove bite marks into the mainstream culture and made a lot of these people stars. And so they did the largest dental dragnet in American history, as far as I can tell, and they had check the text, the dentition, the biting surface of teeth of all 3,000 suspects who potentially could have left these bite marks on Teresa Perone's thighs. Stephen Cheney, I mean, I'm sorry, um, 
Keith Harward was identified as a potential biter in that. And, um, and they, they retested him and then he was excluded. Um, and then the case was getting cold. Four months went by. Two U.S. senators weighed in. Um, Alphonse D'Amato in New York, for those of you who remember him, and another senator from Virginia put pressure on the Navy and the local police to make an arrest. And so what happens is that Keith Harward, four months after this incident, is home with his girlfriend. They're both drunk. They get into a physical altercation. She hits him in the head with a frying pan. He bites her in the shoulder. They both get arrested. So suddenly, though, this arrest comes across the wire. And Keith Harward, apart from the fact that he wore a mustache, generally fit the description. And now he's a known so-called biter, right? And so they took Teresa Perone to his arraignment to see if she could identify him. And to her credit, amazingly, she doesn't identify him because she never got a good look at his face. So the only thing that they had to go on was so-called bite mark evidence. And he had already been excluded as a potential biter, right? But what they did is they brought in one of the guys from the Ted Bundy case, a guy named Lowell Levine out of New York, who is an ascendant forensic celebrity. And he decided that there was Keith Harward who did this and only Keith Harward who could have done that. One of his colleagues backed him up on that. And that was the linchpin of the case. And it was a death penalty case. And the only reason that his life was spared is because his parents took the witness stand and begged for his life. For only time that Keith Harward had ever seen his father weep was from the witness stand in Newport News. And the evidence was so compelling that Keith Harward's own brother told me this many, many, 35 years later, that he never believed that he'd done it. But when he was in court, he started having doubts because the bite mark evidence was so compelling. And those, his parents died before Keith Harward was ever exonerated. He had totally given up hope. And the only reason that we came across this, and this is the story that I opened the book with, you know, I mean, is that I had my paralegal when I started working at the Innocence Project and we were looking for these junk science cases. So like, find me every bite mark conviction that exists in, in the country and we're going to take a look at all of these. And I read the appellate opinion that was affirming his life sentence that if you were skeptical about bite mark evidence, which of course I was, he sounded innocent. I was like, this is all they've got? And so we reached out to him and we took his case and just dumb luck, they still had the evidence preserved in, um, in, in it was in the Virginia Supreme Court. I had a, a law fellow of mine um, found it. And um, to the DA's great credit, didn't fight the DNA testing on it. And when they tested the DNA and excluded Mr. Harward, it was redundant DNA all over the house and in various areas that were probative, um, the same man's DNA. And then, you know, what I call like kind of the checkmate of the criminal legal system is it was uploaded to CODIS and identified the actual perpetrator, a guy named John Crotty, who had died in Ohio prison after committing many, many more crimes after um, the rape of Teresa Prone and the murder of her husband. So, you know, that was one of the early cases I had taken at the Innocence Project, you know, I mean, and, you know, but and you're I, leaving out the, the junk science part, because as you establish in your book, these dentists who then claim their other expertise, actually, there was no recognized board certifying. They that. invented it. Yeah. And the fact is, and I didn't know this until I read your book, uh, that a bite mark will disappear unless it penetrates deeper, that you really can't tell anything looking at these pictures. And so the, the, when you say junk science, people should understand we're talking about total, I don't want to do a play on your name, but fabrication. Right. Here, uh, right. You know, of, uh, 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 I mean, it's just bizarre when you think about it, that intelligent, well-educated people all nodded their head. And then even in a court would say, yes, I, I have no doubt that that young man did it. And you know darn well that when you just bite into like the uh, surface, it's going to disappear. It doesn't make the same indent. It's not accurate in any way. I mean, well, the, this is the true with all junk science is that if you're not critically thinking about it, it has good curbside appeal, right? You think about 
bloodletting, right? You know, it was like kind of made some sense. It lasted thousands of years, right? Kind of made some sense. Ah, I'm sick. I got some blood, a virus in my blood. I'm going to get some new blood and I'll feel better, right? And then finally they did some research and, uh, you know, this is bullshit. But what, if you think about with bite mark evidence, right? is that it makes a certain amount of intuitive sense, right? It's like, oh, we have a bite mark. If we can find the teeth that left that bite mark and match it up, we've got our perpetrator. But, you know, just even like the fun, the threshold issue in a, a diagnosing an injury as a bite mark, which was not an issue in Mr. Harward's case because the victim had lived and she said the sailor bit me, right? But even on that, we know now today that there's no way to reliably diagnose those injuries. But even before that research came out, what I never saw, and I looked at hundreds of these cases, is a cross-examination made the obvious point, is that bite marks are made in skin. Skin is an ever-changing medium. And when you have a deceased victim, the decomposition happens immediately, and it changes hour to hour, day to day, week to week. With a, heal- with a surviving victim that swells, and then it heals, and it changes constantly, right? So you would have somebody matching a bite mark one day and not matching it the next. It just depends on when the photographs were taken and when they were compared. So even this basic thing, right? This is not true with any of these other like fingerprints or these other things. So you're not gonna have constantly changing the way that this thing looks. So, you know, that's what's frustrating about it, right? And this is why we have all these biases about the defendant is guilty, right? They bring them into court, two strikes are against the defendant immediately. Is that virtually everybody believes they're guilty. And I write about an arson case in my book that where the prosecutor admitted this and saved this person's life because he said, I knew that I could get this conviction, but I was not convinced by the science. And so I decided to dismiss it. And that was, you know, one in a million prosecutor, but he absolutely would have gotten that conviction because jurors believe the science. They believe the experts. And this is why I wrote the book was to try to get into the mainstream media so they culture. They don't believe the science. They believe the junk science. And I mean, I think this is really important because we live in a culture where science attained a very high level of respect and these are inherently wise people and it can be and is consistently misused. That's why I brought up the case in advertising, uh, cigarette claims for cigarettes, fertilizer, everything, uh, fake sciences, you know, can be purchased and made to look compelling. And I, I, I do want to say, though, what's, what, what is great about your writing, let me give a plug for this book, is you make us care about these people. And I suspect that for most people, they don't put themselves in the shoes of somebody, you know, even though he was white, even though supposedly the system was working for him, young man in the Navy, and so forth, his parents die thinking he did, maybe did this heinous crime. And I, I, I just, I mean, reading your book, that's the thing I just couldn't get past. The idea that somebody's sitting there and the people who put them there are, they're at, and, you know, let me now be critical of the current Supreme Court. If in, I, I just don't get the argument for saying it's over. We're not going to revisit it and so forth. First of all, it's not true that these people are overrepresented. Most of the time they're inadequately represented. You know, and, and uh, anyway, so I don't know. We wrap this up, but uh, the book is called Junk Science. Now, let me hold it up here uh, I'm on the radio. I can't hold it up, but it's Junk Science and the American Criminal Justice System. And I, I, I the reason I, I wanted to do this and I want people to read the book is it's new. It's the new cop out now. And that's why I brought up the Cooper case. Oh, if you can nail somebody with it, oh, then there's no question. No question. Who are these people? What are the other evidence? Could it be stacked or so forth? And, you know, some people will get off thanks to some a group like the Innocence Project or a few others. So it's good that we have this mechanism. But basically, we live in a lock them up, throw away the key society where we really. And that's why I'm going to go lose sleep tonight for letting you get away with saying, oh, well, most of them are guilty. Uh, <laughs> guilty of what? Uh, and how did they get? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't want I don't want that piece to be overstated. You know, I mean, it, is that 
you know, and, and whether they should have been charged with any particular crime or whether they're overcharged and the sentences and whether that they could get. be rehabilitated and all the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to be clear about that, you know I mean? And, and I, they have committed some of the acts, at least some of the acts that have been charged. And, you know, imagine we lived in a society where that wasn't true, right? Where most people in prison were innocent, right? You know I mean? It's like, and had done absolutely none of the acts that were charged, but the, the rot, you know, of our, of that underlies mass incarceration, you know, is the drug war and it's the super predator mindset where we're never going to let anybody out and we're going to make no efforts to rehabilitate anybody, you know, meaning that we're going to saw off any avenues to get their convictions overturned or let anybody out on parole or give anybody an education while they're incarcerated to maybe they can re like re-enter society in a productive way. All of these are Massive, massive issues, and I don't, would never want anything that that I say as somebody who's worked in this industry for my entire career to be misconstrued to say that like that I was saying it's fair. <laughs> it's not. It's just like that that particular point, you know. Well, is what one I was reason trying to we've got some bipartisan support for reform of the criminal justice system is that, and it happened really around Nixon with some Republicans going to jail. Uh, who were in an administration that was tough on crime, and then suddenly they're on the other side. Right. Watch, see. watch the Trump uh, like folks complaining about the criminal justice system. Yeah, soon, and then right. see the reality uh, of it and how uh, un unfair. But, but I mean, I, I, I want to end on this because you know the, the delusion, perhaps, of some people would be okay. We have DNA. We have the Innocence Project. We have good. Earnest lawyer. We have a pro bono system where even some big corporations do it. And then you look at this figure. Let's end on this figure: two point three million people in the in the in the prison system, right? And that translates into a much larger percentage of the population that is affected by this. And it also is racially uh, focused, right? In, in terms of minorities and income and so forth. And so I just want to challenge in a few minutes here, we'll take a few minutes more, that all we have to do is have, okay, I'll give a contribution to the Innocence Project, which people should do. I'm not dis disputing that. Oh, and we have DNA testing, so real science is coming in. And I, I am overwhelmed with the sense of, I, I, I mean, because uh, uh, I've looked into this particular case, I don't want to take time here for that now, but I've looked into other cases where cynicism rules, including mm -hmm. the political class, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I remember our former governor, Jerry Brown, and, you know, good fellow in many ways, but, uh, you know, in the particular case I was talking about, in other cases, he said, well, I would have to believe that the district attorney or some people and four or five people uh, all uh, conspired to convict this person, but in your book, you show whether by accident or political opportunism or whatever, you got people out who other people who are charged with protecting us were perfectly willing to lock up, throw away the key, and maybe even kill them. Why don't Absolutely. we focus on that a bit? Because the assumption all here is, okay, if we just have some, you know, the DNA means, so we still have basically good actors. Good yeah, actors. Well they, but what if they're playing with DNA? What if they don't uh, b try to block getting the test? What you know? And uh, let's say you know what I what I, I tried to do. Um, the cases that I they, these are my clients' cases and their lives, and I thank them for allowing me to share them. The is they're exceptional cases. They're that's why they're in the book, right? And and I wrote about three of my clients and their decades long struggles. And then I, in parallel to their stories, what I tried to do was weave in the changes that were that the criminal justice system was undergoing at the same time, efforts at reform, some of the problems that were becoming worse. And what became clear to me through this narrative and through my work is that the the system is really designed. And, and working exactly as it is intended to work. And that is to have plea bargains rule, which is like 95% of cases, and that there be no review of this process. 
And DNA is, you know, I get very frustrated when um, people point to DNA exonerations as some sort of like an air rate for the justice system, right? You know, which is nonsense, given all of the obstacles there are for overturning it, even when you have great DNA evidence. But the reality is, is one is that overwhelmingly cases are ple- are played out. And two is that DNA is available maybe 5, 10% of criminal cases. You think about, you know, these are only the reason that all, almost all of our cases are rapes and murders at the Innocence Project is because those are intimate, serious crimes where DNA and biological evidence is much more likely to be um, collected and stored and tested. You think about every burglary, every robbery, every drive by shooting, every trespass, every, you know, all these other crimes, which are the bread and butter of our legal system, there's no DNA testing. There are no witnesses. You know, these are, you know, if there are witnesses, there is what we know from DNA testing is that their eyewitness identification is very unreliable. So there are huge problems that DNA is never going to be able to fix. And DNA can be manipulated and can be planted as well as discovered. Okay, the book is Junk Science and the American Criminal Justice System, as I say, and there are a number of very famous writers and others recommend this book. And uh, I shouldn't have said it's a joy to read. It's, it's, well, people like to read about murder stories and detective stories. They do. This is a detective story that really tells you how the whole thing works. So I want to, uh, uh, you know, let me say I have a conflict of interest here. I was once published by your publisher, Akashic Press, run by an ex-rock and roller, Johnny Temple. I have great respect for him. But yes, I do. Same here. I, I, Same here. I have a connection here. Uh, let me, okay, so the book is available. It's out in paperback. It's more affordable. It was very well received the first time around. And I want to thank Laura Con. Dorajian, I'm finally getting this right, Laura Kandorajian, who has been great at posting these shows at KCRW, the NPR station in Santa Monica, and Christopher Ho was, was there at the station helping doing this. Joshua Shear, our executive producer, Diego Ramos, who writes the introduction, and uh, Max Jones, who does the video podcast, which we have up on YouTube. And I want to thank the JKW Foundation in memory of a great journalist, Gene Stein, for giving, uh, creating some opportunity for us to do this and actually have a little bit of funding. Uh, see you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. <laughs> <laughs>